Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see some people back with us this morning, see the Lassens and see Molly. And who else am I missing? Anybody else that's been gone for a while? Okay. But it's still wonderful to see the, even all the, re the rest of you that are normally here. So um, it's uh, what a turnaround. We were doing worship at the park not 30 minutes ago, and now we're here leading our second worship service of the day. So I just want to invite you to stand and sing with us this morning as we begin singing at your name. At your name, the mountain is shaking humble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. Shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. At your name, the morning breaks in glory. At your name. Shout your name. through the announcement super quick. What are you doing, Danica? I said, don't be seated. Just <laughs> so announcements are really quick this week. Uh, Jan is not going to be able to do women's Bible study this week. And so there's no women's Bible study on Tuesday. We'll look for the following week. 
Second of all, trunk or treat. We still need people to sign up for trunks. The list is right here in the very back. Lynn, raise your hand. Lynn, raise your hand. So look, look at Lynn, and then right behind Lynn. That's where the list is this morning. The next thing, Operation Christmas Child, we've got shoe boxes. Take shoe boxes, fill them, bless children around the world. And then the other thing is on Saturday, uh, we have a celebration of life for Deneen Tucker. Deneen attended with us um, for a number of years. Uh, she, she was hospitalized at the beginning of 2020, so uh, we really haven't seen her. Most people hadn't seen her in the last year and three quarters. Um, she passed away at 50 years old. Um, uh, a few weeks ago. And so on Saturday at 11 o'clock, we're having a memorial service in here. So if you want to be a part of that, if you want to come for that, we would love to have you. Um, and Sue is trying to get a hold of people to help uh, with the reception. So if you can help by providing any food for that, see Sue. See, raise your hand. There we go. Sue right here, um, she still needs a little bit of help with that. So those are the announcements. Let's continue singing. and burning suns blazing in the heavens there is only one he is our God who commands the nations building up and tearing down silencing his rivals there is only one he is our God glory we thank you that you've allowed us to be partakers of that through the giving of your spirit through faith in your son and so we pray that today 
we would learn more about you, that we would learn more about your presence and what it means to um, not only experience your presence, but to understand um, how you have made us and what you have done in our lives to, um, to bring us closer to you. And so today we pray that you would fill Ben with your spirit, that you would give him wisdom and understanding as he shares your word, that you would give him boldness and clarity of uh, mind and um, just a purity of heart that you would just bless him and that you would bless us through the word that is shared. And uh, we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated. So, hey, Heather, can you flip fans on? Get some air moving in here. <sighs> well, it's, it's good to see you guys. It is wonderful to be back here this morning. It's great, as I said before, to see some faces we haven't seen in a while and, uh, you know, to, to be able to worship the Lord together is a privilege and an honor. If you've got your Bibles, open up to Psalm 139. We've been working our way for the last three weeks through Psalm 139, and we are now in verses 13 through 18. Now, for the past two decades, my mother has been undertaking a large task. When uh, Heather and I got married and then my, my siblings started getting married, my mom decided that what she wanted to do is she wanted to make quilts for each of us. She wanted to make some kind of special quilt for, for each uh, of her children when they got married. And then she decided that beyond that, she wanted to start making personalized special quilts for her grandkids. And so starting with Michaela, she began to make these quilts. So she made Michaela's quilt at first. She made one of Michaela's cousin's quilts. In the next slide here, we've got uh, one that she did for my sister who lives, it lived in Crater Lake at the time. And she just started making these beautiful quilts. And each one of these was special, right? They've got grandma's love in them. There's something that she has made specifically for us and connected to us. But of all the quilts that she made, my favorite one is the one that she made for my second son, Calvin. If you guys know me, you know that I have quite an affinity for the comic strip Calvin and Hobbes. In fact, that's where, where Calvin got uh, his namesake. You know, there are several different areas, but by and large, if you want to be honest... It's Calvin and Hobbes. And so my mom showed up in 2017 with this quilt that she had made for Calvin. And it, to me, it just blows my mind. It's this beautiful piece of art that she had brought together. It's made with a grandma's love. Every piece and part carefully measured, carefully designed, carefully assembled. And the final product still blows me away. In a lot of ways, my mom's artistic endeavors and the way that she took the time to just go through and work out every single little piece and get every single little detail exactly where it needed to be reminds me a lot of what God has done in his creative work. See, in love, he undertook the creation of the world and he filled the earth with creatures to love and he made each of us a reflection of himself that are different and unique and special in this world. Like, they tell you that everybody has a doppelganger, right? Somewhere out there, there's a guy that looks exactly like me and just like you. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I've seen some similar looking people, but every one of us has been made unique by the God who created us. And today, we're going to talk about finding comfort in God's creative genius. Now, in this series so far, in the first week, we talked about God's omniscience, God's all-knowing nature. And then we talked the following week, last week, about God's omnipresence. He is everywhere with us. He leads us. And we take comfort in both of those things. God has not missed anything. He knows it all. Nothing takes him by surprise. God is with us and leads us. And this morning, we're going to talk about God's omnipotence, which means his all-powerful nature. It is in God's power that he has created us. So if you've got your Bibles open to Psalm 139, let's read verses 13 through 18. This is what it says. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. 
Today we're going to look at how we've been made and what that tells us about God and how this truth about God in the interaction that we've had with him, even from our very conception, can bring us hope and peace in difficult times. So this morning we're going to make four observations here, and the first is this. God has demonstrated his power through our creation. So let's just start with the fundamental facts of this passage. What does it tell us about where we came from? What, is that, what does the passage tell us about where we came from? You guys can answer. This is, a, this is a call and response. Tells us God made us, right? Like if you want to summarize this little set of verses here, it is that God made us. Now we know that each and every one of us was, was the product of biological processes whereby an egg and a sperm came together and we grew for essentially nine months within our mother's womb and we came out either through cesarean or through natural birth. We know these things, but we oftentimes do not take into consideration the absolute miracle it is of that happening. I want you to consider the probability of your ancestors living to birthing age. I want you to consider the probability of all the people in the world, your grandparents coming together. Consider the probability of your parents coming together and being at the right place in the right time in order for you to be conceived. Beyond that, I want to add this fact here that a woman over the course of her lifetime, when she's born, she has roughly 100,000 eggs. In the time a man is alive, he will produce roughly 14 trillion sperm. And the statistical chance of the right two coming together in order to create you is one in 400 quadrillion. You want to know the statistics of you existing as you are here in this place right now? Just the generation from which you come, it's one in 400 quadrillion. Now you start multiplying that past all the other things and you have to ask the question, like, how are those, that generations long process, how is that guided? How exactly are those things determined? And of all the viable genetic matches that could have come together, how is it that these processes have been guided to create you? Like, do you understand that if any one variable is different, you don't exist or somebody exists in your place and it's not you? Like God is the one who guided these. And Psalm 139 tells us God did this. Do you know the biological processes whereby we're made? Do you know who made that? God did, right? And, and you know who guided the probabilities of us being here? God did. And so David says, God made us. And verse 13 reminds us of this important fact here. He says, for you formed my inward parts. Like it's the language of intentionality. We are not a product of chance. Like, think about that. Whenever you're going through struggles, whenever you're feeling worthless, whatever's going on, you are not a product of chance. We are not a cosmic accident. We are the result of God's intention in God's benevolence. Before we dive into the specifics of all of this, the foundation of our peace and well-being has to be that we are not an accident. I think about that right now. You are here in this sanctuary, and it is not by accident that you are here, and it is not by accident that you are here in the world. God has made you on purpose, and God has guided the generations-long process of getting you to this place. And when you start thinking about that, that is unfathomable power that God can sit here and dictate the, the, the events and guide the processes of life to get us to this exact moment where we're here right now. And God has used that power to create David, who wrote this psalm, and to create you and to create me. God did this. Now, a lot of times, when we go to, to look for a, a new product to buy, whether it's something like a computer or a car or a truck, we typically look for brand, right? Like most people, they're looking for brand because they've had a good experience. There's a lot of people out there that when they go to buy a truck, they're like, I will only buy a Chevy because I equate, equate that with quality. Not me, I don't equate that with quality, but there are people who do. There are others who look at it and they're like, I'll only buy a Ford or I'll only buy a Toyota. When we go to buy a computer, where do we start as a family? We go to Lenovo. That's where we always start. Other people, they go to Apple or HP or Dell if they don't know anything about computers. And so like, we, we all have a direction we go, something that we equate with quality. And I want you to know that every single one of you has been stamped with a made by God. God does not make junk. God does not make mistakes. God intentionally, supernaturally, divinely creates things that are worthwhile. God made us. 
But we don't just want to stop at that. God has demonstrated his power through creation. But secondly, God has demonstrated his loving intentions through our creation. If you look at verses 13 through 16, it starts to give some details here in how we're made. And David describes this in some poetic language, and we need to make sure that we don't get hyper-literalistic in this. We need to understand that the language David uses is intentionally poetic language. So I, I, we, we don't need to imagine God with a set of crochet hooks or scissors or anything else like that, despite the way he's going to describe this. Because what does it say? You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. He says, I was intricately woven in verse... 15 in the depths of the earth. The underlying truth is that our form formation is God's work. And to describe how David employs this, this imagery here, behind the biological processes of our development is a mastermind who guides everything with intentionality, with beauty, and with grace. God does all things well. So look at the phrases. First of all, God has delicately formed us. God has delicately formed us. You've formed my inner parts. Now that word form, imagine like somebody using clay and, and, and crafting and forming something. And then he goes on, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. He said in verse 15, my frame was not hidden for you when I was being made in secret, when I was being crafted in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. He uses the word knitted and he uses the word formed and the word intricately woven. And these are artistic words. David didn't see his creation as being the least bit utilitarian, right? Like we are not an assembly line creature. We are crafted together by the, the intentionality in goodness of God. Prior to going into ministry, I was an art student and I loved to be around other art people. Art people are fun to be around. They create worlds with, with the, the sculpting and with the pen and with, with uh, the brush. They, they create all of this stuff. Like there's some pictures here I wanted to share with you. Like somebody using a pen here to do this intricate thing. This second piece here in the middle, that is carved out of, out of marble. Like that's a carving. That to me is incredible. This is, this is a painting. I love to be around these artistic people. And when you'd be around them, you'd see like this joy and this care and this purpose. And I can recall when I was in college, sitting there with my friend Chris, who liked to draw, and just this determination and this focus, like his brow furrowed as he sat here with a pencil and the pen, just making sure that every single little detail was exactly perfect. And that's how I have to imagine God when I read Psalm 139. That God is the one who's sitting here making sure every little detail is perfect, making sure that everything is exactly as he intended it to be. His perfect wisdom, his perfection, all of this, he pours into the creation of people. And the result is something that only God could do. He has delicately formed us. Second of all, God's work is wonderful. In verse 14, he says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. David, again, uses a, a, a form of that rare word we talked about two weeks ago in verse 6, where he says, your knowledge is wonderful. That is beyond comprehension, beyond the ability to fathom. But here he says that God's works, God's works are being wonderful, or as some versions say, marvelous, mind-blowing. In, in other words, David is saying that God has done things that are extraordinary, beyond what we can comprehend. He says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And we look at that, we're like, what does that mean? Dr. Alan Ross explains, he says, what David is saying is, I am extraordinary in a way that produces fear and reverence. Now, that's not something we want to go just talking about all the time, like walk into a room and tell everybody, I am extraordinary in a way that produces fear and reverence. People aren't probably going to respond too well to that, especially if they, they realize you're not joking, but that's what David is saying. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm extraordinary in a way that produces fear or reverence. I don't know if any of you guys have ever had a moment where you, you had a realization that produced fear and reverence in you. Like for me, that moment was when we went to Arizona a few years ago and we got out of the car, we were going to the Grand Canyon. And in my mind, everybody had always told me the same thing. The Grand Canyon will blow your mind. I'm like, nothing blows my mind. I'm jaded and bittered to everything. And so I got out and I walked over there. And when we went through the little tower there, I guess on the south, on the, the east end or wherever it was at, and we walked across the thing and I got my first glimpse of the Grand Canyon, my mind was blown. I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, 
That is incredible. The scope and the magnitude and the beauty of it. It was just incredible to see right there in that tower, even though it's, it's, it's a national parks building, there's a little insert and it's got some scripture about the wonder of God's works. And I looked at it and that's all I could think is this is beautiful and, and it brought about awe and reverence. And if we look at a human being and really explore the complexity of a human being, that's what it ought to do is it ought to give us pause as we think about the beauty. Every cell, every atom, every neural synapse, every system, every fiber of our being is evidence of a God who is powerful beyond our comprehension. I mean, just take, just take your hand for a second and look at it and, and just be like, I, I couldn't design that if I was given a thousand years to try to come up with this. I couldn't have created this out of nothing. And what it tells us in the Bible is God spoke these things into existence. He said, let there be light. He said, he said let there be a firmament. He said, let there be creeping things on the earth. God invented in his mind these things. And it just speaks of his power. Romans chapter 1 tells us that God has made himself uh, visible through all of creation. Like if we start looking around and we start pulling leaves off the trees and looking at them under a microscope and we start really comprehending what we're made of and all of the things that are in the universe, that is the fingerprints of God. It's evidence of God's existence. And if we really stare into the wonder of what has been made and we abandon this ridiculous notion of any of this coming into existence as the product of, of chance, and we will be in awe of the one who can create such complex biological machines that think and emote and love and worship. Like God could make all of this. The work itself reflects the one who made it. In fact, that's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Like God reveals himself in our creation, in, in our making. So that if you look at another human being, you ought to be in awe of what God has done. Because we couldn't imagine that. We couldn't make that. Not if we had all of eternity to try to figure it out. God is the one who created it all. The creation of a human being is an incredible thing that only God can do. We're knitted together by loving intent and we're placed in this world. Your very existence, the, the, the chances of it happening and the way that it happened is miraculous. And it's important for us to understand that we're not just some speck of cosmic dust. We are, our, our life exists for a vapor, but God creates us to be eternal creatures. He creates us in beauty and puts in our hearts the, the understanding of eternity and allows us to persist from the time that he creates us for all of eternity. And that is a testament of God's goodness. You are miraculous. You are important. None of us is an accident. This is, by the way, the passage and also one of the major reasons why the vast majority of Christians see abortion as such a heinous thing. Psalm 139 is one of those key passages to remind us that life is sacred. Like to willfully take the life of a child, whether that child is born or unborn, regardless of the complications that come with it, and there are oftentimes complications that come with it, is one of the most evil things that human beings have ever done. You know, when the people of Israel were up against the wall and they were trying to figure stuff out, it tells us that they began to sacrifice their children to foreign gods, they begin to take the lives of their children. And what it tells us in Ezekiel 16, 20 through 21 is this. God says to Israel, says, you took your sons and your daughters whom you had born to me. Like God claims them. You've born these children to me and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whorings so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up to an offering by fire? Leviticus 18.21 says that it profanes the name of God. Deuteronomy 12.31 calls it an abomination because God made us and gave us this ability, right? This is an incredible ability that we can, we can procreate, that, that God will use us to craft human beings. And a parent's job is to protect children and to love them and to lead them to the Lord, not to determine that they are expendable. Psalm 127.3 says that children are a heritage the fruit of the womb, a reward. When you, hear, when you hear testimonies of people who have worked in the abortion industry and who have come out of it, sometimes you hear stories of, of babies and fetuses being dismembered through clamps and grasping forceps and tongs and scissors. And when I, when I hear that, after having read Psalm 139, I think of what, what, an, what a rebellion that is from mankind. 
as God lovingly knits us and weaves us together, we in our depravity and rebellion begin to take apart what God is doing. It's a heinous thing because of the fact that it's God who does this. Like some want to believe it's about choice, but in reality it's about control because God is the one who is involved in crafting and creating human beings. And when we step into that process thinking it's just us and begin to undo what God is doing, that is an act of rebellion. Now having said that, let me caveat this just a bit. We as Christians need to be very careful. This is not a sermon about abortion, by the way, but it's something that the text brings up for us, right? How is it children are made? Like there's the picture I threw up here on the screen here. And, you know, Psalm 138, Jeremiah 1, 5, Isaiah 44, 2, all talk about how God created us and how he knew us even when we were in the womb that he designed and he planned for us, all of this stuff. So it's something that we need to talk about. But as Christians, we need to be careful about how we speak about this subject and and those who have, have been involved in this. You know, there are people in your life There are people that you know, there are people that you love, there are probably people in this room who have had an abortion at some point, and we don't want to somehow convey that people who have done this have done the unpardonable sin and that they're forever damned to hell because of a decision that they made. We need to acknowledge it's sin, but then we need to be compassionate about how we engage people who have come to the point of desperation where they believe that the only only thing that they have left to do is to take the life of their child. God has grace for those who are involved in abortion, but we also need to allow what the word teaches us right here in Psalm 139. We need to allow this to govern uh, how we think about this and drive us to protect and advocate for the sanctity of life because our lives and our creation and our being knit together is purposeful, intentional. It is the work of a loving God who knows us prior to our even being born and loves us as we are conceived and even before. God has demonstrated his loving intentions in how we've been made. God has demonstrated his power through creation. And then thirdly, God has demonstrated his control through our creation. Verse 16, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when there was not yet one of them. So not only has God lovingly made us, but he's also laid out a plan and a program for us. Anybody that's ever gone to college, when you start college, they give you a degree completion plan. And if you follow the degree completion plan, you have as good a chance as anybody to make it out of there in four years. Now, almost nobody makes it out in four years now, but they lay this in front of me and they're like, this is when the classes are offered. If you take this and you follow this, you'll be done in four years. And then to make it even better, they go, and here's a guidance counselor, boop. This guy is here to help you make it from point A to point B. If you listen to what he has to say when you meet with him every semester and he tells you you need to do this and this, you'll be done. Now, I didn't listen to either of those things, the degree completion plan or the counselors. I kind of did my own thing, which is why I spent six years in college and I changed programs and changed schools. But before I took my first class, like before I even enrolled in Auburn University in Montgomery, Alabama, that before I took that first thing, there was in existence a degree completion plan for the graphic design major. That thing existed, and if I followed it, it would make sure that I had every class that I needed. It would make sure that I had everything I needed for my career, and it would make sure that I completed everything in a timely way. So think of that in kind of terms of what God has done. Before we took our first breath, God has put together a program for our lives, knowing the beginning from the end, knowing everything in eternity past and everything in eternity present and everything that you will ever do and every decision that you will ever make. God knew all of this. He sets up a schedule. He sets up the resources that we need. And David, when he looks at this in verse 16, he sees God's fingerprints on everything. You saw my unformed substance. You saw me before I was even a thing. And in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when there was not yet one. So we know that God knows the full scope of our lives. He has that in view. God sees everything. Now we talked in the first week about the fact that God knows and God sees everything. But here David makes it intensely personal. It's not just that God sees everything. See, for us, a lot of times we think of God as this distant other. And, and yes, we know God knows everything. We know that God is involved in everything. But David is drawing this person. He's saying, God, you knew every single one of my days, every single one of the days of my life before even one of them existed. See, he doesn't just know everything in, in general. 
David is like, he knows and has paid attention to every single detail and aspect of my life. Guys, that's something that's meant to, to comfort us. Like when we start thinking about that, God knows everything in my life. In 1997, 1997, 98, and 99 were bad years for our family. We had somebody die at the same time of year every single year. So you didn't even get to mourn for the person that you lost the year before when it came down to that anniversary because somebody else was passing away. And in 1997, we lost somebody who was really dear to our family. And I remember going into my room and closing the door, and I was there by myself. And I was, I was heartbroken by, by what had happened, that, that this young person that we knew had died in, in such a horrible way. And I remember just sitting there being alone and thinking like nobody understands, but yet God was there and God saw and God understood. In 2015, when we lost my, my grandmother and my aunt and my grandfather all in the course of a month, I remember driving down the road one night and I pulled over to the side of the road and I just wept. Because the pain and the loss, I, I wept and I was there by myself in the dark and I was thinking, no, nobody gets what's coming on, but God was there, and God saw it, and God knew. And God has already seen the sadness that's going to come one day when, when my parents pass away. And God has already seen the day that, that Heather and I will, will lose one another. Like, he's seen all of this. He's seen the joy and the pain in the past, and he's seen the joy and the pain in the future, and he has been present for every one of these things. He has known every single detail of our lives from before I was conceived till the day that I die and on to eternity. God has the full scope of our lives in view. You remember that. For every pain you've ever gone through and every pain you will go through in the future, God is there and God is present and God sees it and he knows it. The details of your life are important to him. You ever feel insignificant? Like you ever feel like you're alone in this world? You ever feel like nobody gets what's going on? God has already known and seen every single detail of your life and the joy and the pain from before you were conceived all the way into eternity. God has seen it. But it's more than that. It's not just that he's seen it. He's been involved. God has made us for a purpose. Look at what he says here. He says, in your book were written every one of them these days. God has already written the end of your story. Now, he's the divine author who has already planned your character arc, right? Like, he knows where you come into the story. He knows where you're born, how you move from birth into adulthood, how you move from adulthood into parenting, how you move from parenting into loss, how you move from loss into death. Like he's already written that story. He's been sovereignly involved in how you got from point A to point B and how you'll get on to point C. Now, this is a place where a lot of times people will hear this kind of thing and they'll go, well, that's fatalism, right? That's fatalism, right? I have no choices. My choices don't matter, and that's not true. You do have choices in this world, and there are consequences for your choices, but everything that happens happens under the umbrella of God's sovereignty, and while for some they, they find that to be disturbing, that there is, there is this level of power and control that God is exercising, that ought to be something that gives us peace. At, at no place, in no time, do we ever escape the oversight or the good intentions of God. Think about the darkest thing that you have ever gone through. Think about the most painful thing that you have ever gone through. At no point did he release you. At no point were you out of his hands. At no point did he miss what was going on in your life. God has made us for a purpose, and he leads us to find that purpose. One of the ways that we know this is because in the book of Ephesians, you guys that were out there at the park this morning for worship, I already read this passage, but in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we're told that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works. But then he ends this segment in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 by saying this. He says, for we are his workmanship. The idea is tied together with what's going on here in Psalm 139. We are his handiwork. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, before we even existed, God had already put together a program of our lives whereby we can live in such a way that we glorify and honor him because of who he is and what he's done. 
And that's got to be something that encourages us. You know, there's a lot of us that walk through life and we wonder, why am I here and what is my purpose? And do I exist for a reason beyond just what's going on here? God, is there, is there some reason or purpose for me to be here? And the answer to that question is yes. God has, has already laid out. He already knows everything that's going on in your life and he's involved in that. He's answered the question and given us a higher purpose. And our purpose in life is inextricably connected to his intentions. And when we know that, suddenly our lives begin to make sense. Do not look for your purpose and your meaning in this life apart from God. You were made to worship God. You were made to know God. You were made to relate to God. You were made for a relationship with God and his people. And your purpose is tied to this very thing. God has been sculpting and crafting us into what he wants us to be. You know, a lot of times when I was growing up, I, I looked around at what people did and I thought there were sacred and secular vocations, right? There are some people whose vocation is sacred. So if you're a pastor, you're a missionary, you're something like this, that's kind of a set apart thing. And if you work as a doctor or an engineer or a firefighter or something else, that's a secular thing. But here's the reality of it. God has made us to worship him and interact with him. And all of this is tied together with every part of our lives. God has been sculpting pastors and doctors and builders and welders and engineers and teachers and firefighters and whatever it is that you are for his glory. And when we realize that, our lives can begin to make sense because we understand that God has a purpose for where we are right now. Whether you're in retirement or you're right in the middle of your work, God has a purpose for you being right there. If you are a mother that's homeschooling your kids, God has a purpose for you right there. If you are enjoying your retirement, God has is, is got a purpose for you right there. If you are struggling through and fighting tooth and nail to make it through your career, God is with you right there. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, he says, Whatever you, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, he just goes ahead and throws it all out here. Eat, drink, whatever you do in life, whatever's going on, do all to the glory of God. You know, we can go out this, this week and go into whatever it is that God has called us to do, and we can treat that as a sacred vocation. You know, it's not just me that gets up here and teaches the Bible that has a sacred vocation. Every single one of you does too. God has a purpose in your life. Even if your job is hard and frustrating, and I get it, I'm looking at you guys and there are several of you that I know, like it's crushing your soul right now. Some of you parents, like my stay-at-home motherness is crushing my soul right now. I don't know that any of our retirees are like that. But you guys are enjoying the retirement there, but despite the fact that we might be right in the throes of it, we can glorify God in it. We can find purpose in it because God designed us for that and he's put you on the path you are on. Let me, just, let me just clarify that for you. The path that you are on, God has known this path from the beginning and he has placed you there. And so the question is, what do I do with this? Do I honor God and glorify God in this? That's what we're called to do. That is what our life is about. So God has demonstrated his power through our creation. God has demonstrated his loving intention through our creation. God has demonstrated his control in our creation. And then number four, God has demonstrated his worth in our creation. Look at verse 14, 17, and 18. Verse 14, I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. The recognition of God's power in our lives ought to be a thing that drives us to worship. The recognition of what God has done for you to this point in your life, even if there are things out there that I didn't expect to be here and I didn't expect this to be how my life would go and I didn't expect to be with the people that I'm with, it wasn't what I expected. The fact that you are there, God has brought you there and that ought to be a thing that drives us to worship. And so what David tells us in this passage is that the proper response to what God has done, the proper response to everything that's come so far in this from, from God's presence to God's leading to God's knowledge to God's power is all meant to drive us to treasure God's ways. That's the proper response. 
you look at those verses that I just read to you, you get this sense of awe and reverence. He says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm made in such a way that it drives a fear and a reverence for God. He says, your thoughts, which are vast and unsearchable, they're, they're more so than the number of the grains of sand. They are precious to me. I treasure them. David looks at what God has done and who God is and how God interacts. And he's like, these thoughts about you and these thoughts about my life, I treasure these things. They're precious to me. But it's not just because God has these things. David acknowledges that God's thoughts are not just on the creating and sustaining of all things, but God's thoughts are on him as well. If you look at verse 18, and you look at the bottom part of this, it's a very strange little phrase. He's talking about the thoughts of God, and if I count them, they're more than the sand. And then just out of the blue, he's like, I awake, and I am still with you. The Hebrew word there, awake, isn't just a word that means coming out of sleep. It's a word that means to come out of any form or state of meditation. In Psalm 139, David is meditating on who God is. David is thinking about who God is. David is giving his, his thought and his intention to who God is. And when he comes out of this to begin the journey of his life again, he finds that God's loving advocacy wasn't a dream. It wasn't a part of his imagination. But God was still there in that moment and every moment with him. I awake and I am still with you. After I go through all these thoughts of who you are and I praise who you are and I recognize your control over all things and yet I still understand that despite all of this, you still are with me. I'm still with you. It's a very personal connection for David there. Those thoughts and those actions and those intentions are a treasure, David says. They're precious. And then finally, the proper response then is to praise God for his work. When we begin to treasure these thoughts, we do what? We begin to praise God. Verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He sums it all there, praise and worship. To look at my life and to look at my existence and to look at everything that has happened in my life and to know that God has been the one who is working in this drives fear and reverence. When we recognize that God has been involved in our lives and we recognize that God has had loving intentions for us, that's, that's high-octane rocket fuel for living a life of praise. And if we, if we can take here and look in the eyes of our children and we can look at those who we love and we can look around and see the place that God has allowed us to live and the things that we get to be a part of, when we can look at all of these things, that becomes fuel for a life of praise. And we do this in all of life. Like this isn't just related to God. If somebody comes into your house and they lay carpet and they do a good job, you don't usually keep that to yourself, do you? Like you'll tell somebody about it. Somebody will come in and they'll say, oh, I really like your floors. And what will you say? Oh, this guy did it. Or you might go onto social media and post a review. Or you might go to their website. Or you might take their card and give it to somebody else because they did such a good job and you want people to know. Or you'll hear a beautiful song and that song will move you and you'll be listening to it and you'll tell somebody, oh my gosh, have you heard this song by so-and-so? It's brilliant. It's beautiful. I love this. It's meaningful. Like when we come across things that are praiseworthy, we talk about it. Just this last week in the office, we were talking, Dorothy and I, and, and she started talking about the eggplant parmesan over at That's Italian. And she said, you just have to try the eggplant parmesan at That's Italian. That's praise for the eggplant parmesan because she has determined that it is delicious and good. So the guy comes to your house and he lays the carpet well and you begin to praise him. And you hear a song that you love and you begin to praise the person who wrote that song and somebody makes a delicious eggplant parmesan or something else and you praise that chef for it. How much more worthy is God who has made you and made this world and made where you go and made everybody that you have known and loved in your life? How much more worthy of praise is he? Like it should be the thing that just pours out of us. If you bump us, it ought to be the praise of God that comes pouring out of us. Because if we recognize who he is and what he does and how his power, how his omnipotence and how his omniscience and how his omnipresence works in our lives, that is praiseworthy. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are the product of a God that does not make mistakes, who lovingly superintended the shape of your life. And so no matter how much life may be beating you down or how, how worthless you might feel, and I know that's something that we all struggle with, 
because I know that most of us probably have not, things haven't turned out in our lives exactly how we thought they would. You know, things don't turn out in a day exactly how I think they are. Like I lay out all these expectations for myself about what I'm going to do and what I'm going to have done. I foolishly, when I was in my 20s, I was like, by the time I'm 30, I'm going to have published a book. I'm going to have put out an album. And I had this whole long list of things I was going to do. And I was, I was cranking on it. I'd written one children's book at that point. I had drawn all these things. I was recording an album with my friend Scott. And I was going through all this. And I was like, I'm going to have all this done by the time I'm 30. Well, I'm 43 now, and I haven't done any of it. We have a lot of expectations for ourselves that that just don't happen. No matter how down we might be on ourselves, God's word reminds us that we are the masterwork of God Almighty. And our value is not tied up in what we do or don't do or what we accomplish or don't accomplish. Our value is tied up in the one who made us. You wonder why people have value? People have value because they're made in the image of God. People have value because their creator thought the world needed one of those. I think about that the next time you're down on all the people in your life. God thought the world needed one of those. I don't understand why sometimes. But God made us. And for each and every one of us, we are made and loved by God. God has loving intentions for your life. So let that fill you with hope and let that fill you with joy and let that fill you with praise. We serve a powerful, loving, and good God. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the day that you've given us. And Lord, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. And Lord, we're reminded this morning from Psalm 139 of your great and loving intention for us. And Lord God, I just pray that each and every one of us would allow that to just become fuel for praise. Lord, you desire you desire praise from your people. Lord, you've made us to worship. You've made us to interact with you. You've made us to know you. And Lord God, I just pray that, that as we reflect on who you are and what you've done, that each and every one of us would be able to walk out of these doors today and spend our week glorifying you because you are worthy of all praise. Lord God, thank you so much for the life that we have. Thank you so much for bringing us here. Lord, thank you so much for our health. Thank you so much for, for all of the many blessings and all of the many people. Lord, this morning as we sang at the park, 10,000 reasons. Lord, we're just reminded that if we really do begin to take account of everything that you have done, we have the fuel to keep us going for all of eternity. And so, Lord God, we just pray that in, in our lives, from day to day, that you would just drive in us a heart of praise and a heart of worship. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We just ask that you would uh, just bless us throughout this week and remind us of who you are. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I hope that in being here that you were encouraged this morning. I hope that there's somebody that when you came in here and you were feeling down and you were feeling hard on yourself or you were just wondering like what's my point and what's my purpose, that through the God's word this morning you were reminded that God loves you, that God has known you, he has made you, he's been there in every pain and every difficulty and every joy throughout your life and he will be there all the way to the end because he does not fail, he does not abandon us, he does not leave us, he is a good God and he loves us. We end our service the same way every week, and that is that we take an offering. There are offering receptacles at the back of the church. If you're watching this later, you can go to kernvillechurch.com, and you can uh, give an offering there. I am going to do something I haven't done in well over a year, and that's I'm going to the back door, and I'm going to say hi to you guys as you leave, so, um, or bye to you as you leave, but I didn't say hi to some of you, so it'll be high end bye, so... Um, it's wonderful to see you guys, and uh, don't forget to get Operation Christmas Child boxes, and do not forget to sign up for Trunk or Treat. <laughs>